Hey, hey, welcome to part two, champion. Video is all about jumping. We're gonna set up a way to do double jumps, but it can also be like literally just changed by a single variable to give us triple, quadruple, literally however many jumps you wanna have. Even more importantly, we're gonna be able to do variable jumping height, so controlling your jump height based on holding the button. Most games work that way. We're also gonna add input buffering, which is a really cool thing. If you don't know what input buffering is, I explained it a little bit, but basically it's just a way, say if you were to press the jump button, it normally registers for a single frame and so your player jumps but you can create a buffer that basically makes that input last for say three frames instead. And so that way frame perfect things, like if you wanna do a frame perfect jump while on the ground, instead of having only a 60th of a second to input it, you have a 20th of a second, which can feel way better. And in principle, you'll be able to do that with any kind of command you wanna make, but we're just doing it in the context of a jump button. So yeah, you'll see when we get there. Let's get going. Okay, if I did my job even close to right, then you already know what we're doing and I'm not gonna explain it again. So first what I wanna start with is, this is what we had last time and we got our inputs up here. Uh, I wanna show you how to make those WAS controls and gamepad controls. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put all this stuff in a function so any object can immediately get all the inputs that we have. So here's how we're gonna do that. Right click over here, we're gonna create a script. There you are. And I'm gonna name this script over here. I'm just gonna call it, uh, this is gonna be our general functions or custom functions, whatever, just our own things that we make. And so, yeah, that's all that is. You can make your own functions in Game Maker by doing exactly what you just saw. So use the keyword function, and then I'm gonna create one called get controls, like that. Um, and basically, we're just gonna do this, right? So up here, this is where we got our inputs. I'm just gonna control X, get those, and I'm gonna put them right there. So now at the top of any object that we want to have inputs, we can just call get controls like that. And it's doing the same exact thing. So pretty easy. I'm gonna split these out and say, this is a uh, directional inputs. I'm gonna call these action inputs. And remember, like I said, uh, keyboard check, all these just return ones or zeros based on if the button that we're inputting is being pressed, right? So let's look at our right key for a second. I'm just gonna separate it out of here just so we can look at it. So this is the right arrow key. If we wanted to do WASD WASD controls, then we want the D key to be our right key. So instead of VK right, we can say ORD capital D like this. And that basically means that we've replaced the right arrow key with our D key. So pretty cool, but we could also do this. We could add to together two different checks like this so that way we can use either of these as an input and because we want right key to only either be zero or one we can we can do this we can say right key equals clamp we can input the, the value of our right key and then give it a minimum value so it can't go below zero and a maximum value so it can't go below or above one and that's what this function does it takes an input value in this case right key and it just gives it a, a minimum floor and a maximum ceiling it clamps it crazy stuff so now right key will take either of these so if they're both being pressed right key will equal two but then it's turned into a positive one so it won't mess with anything and i'm not going to use the arrow keys i'm going to use wazd but also i'm going to use a gamepad so i'm going to use gamepad button check uh if you only have one gamepad connected in your computer it should be fine to just check for device zero and then i'm going to use the the gamepad constants, so GP, pad R for pad right. And that's gonna be the D-pad right uh, on an X input controller. So like an Xbox controller on Windows will be able to read this totally fine. So this is just so I can check with a controller and with a keyboard. I prefer playing games with controllers, especially platformers, but I, I just like to check with both. So uh, this will let us use either of these. So the same thing can be done with the left key like this. So now our left key is the A key and the left D-pad on a controller and we're clamping it. So that's cool with our directions. I'm gonna do the same thing with pressing the jump key. So it looks like this. And remember, this is jump key pressed. We're not looking for held buttons. So we're not just checking. We need to use the pressed versions of the function. So uh, I'm checking if the space bar is pressed and I'm checking if um, the gamepad face button one is being pressed, which on an Xbox controller, that's an A. On a PlayStation controller, that would be the X or a, <coughs> sorry. That would be the cross button. So it would just be the bottom face button. Uh, and I'm clamping it again. As far as I remember, we never actually used the direct number value for jump key pressed. So we probably don't even really need to clamp this to one. Uh, the reason these need to be clamped to one is because we subtract them from each other and we use them for our movement speed and movement direction, right? So you wouldn't want to be able to press both of these buttons at once and then it would double the speed of the player, which I don't care if this looks weird to you. I'm going to do this. I like to have them show up separate when my eyeballs look at them. But uh, anyways, we only ever 
check if jump key pressed is actually like happening, which means as long as it's above zero, then it'll be fine and it won't really matter what number it is. But um, yeah, so it probably doesn't need to be clamped, but I'm honestly just gonna keep it anyways. So that's cool and all, but now we actually need to add a few more things for our jump key to work because remember, we're gonna be able to hold our jump button to control our height, but also we're gonna be doing things like coyote time and stuff like that. And something that's kind of similar to it is adding input buffering and specifically a uh, jump button buffering. And I wanna show you a way to do that. So first we're just gonna add regular jump key for the held version of the jump key and it's going to be the same as the above function but you know we're just not checking the pressed versions so here's this our held down jump key if you're copying and pasting be careful i don't recommend you do that especially if you're newer because it's very easy to miss things like if you were to just copy this and just get rid of the word pressed you might forget to change these functions you also might forget to change this word so jump key equals keyboard check and keyboard button check not pressed and then we clamp jump key to jump key so anyways we have that now but i'm gonna add another little thing called jump key buffering and we're actually going to need a couple variables for this that especially when it comes to the player we're going to need to set in the create event so let's just create a a pair function to go with our get controls i'm going to call this function controls setup and i'm just going to put this in the create events of uh any objects that use the get controls function so first i'm going to create a variable called buffer time and this is going to be how many frames an input gets buffered for any buffered inputs that we want to have and then we just want variables specific for our jump key being buffered so we'll say jump key buffered equals zero or false this will basically be another true false thing and jump key buffer timer and this will just be the the little timer that you know turns on for three frames and then turns this off so basically what we're going to do is once the jump key is pressed it's going to set jump key buffered to be true and then we're going to set our timer to be three frames or however long this is and then once that timer ticks down our buffer timer will go away this is just another game feel thing which uh hopefully i inserted a very very short little crash course explanation of what input buffering is. I realized I, I didn't say that. Maybe I did in the intro. Anyways, we know how it works now. So let's just actually execute that code. We know that our get controls is always gonna be in a step event. So we can just, you know, this is all updating code constantly, checking for inputs on all frames of the game. So we can do this. If, if our jump key has been pressed, any more room, we can set the jump key buffer timer to be our our buffer time so that'll be three frames and then we can say if our jump key buffer timer is greater than zero our jump key buffered variable becomes one or true and we can count our timer down jump key buffer timer minus minus just subtracts one every single frame so that works and then otherwise we can say if our jump key buffer timer uh is not greater than zero then that should mean our jump key buffered equals zero or false so like i said basically what this is doing is if we press our jump key we're setting a buffer for x amount of frames and as long as that buffer timer is above zero then we have a final variable that we can check for setting itself to true or false based on that timer so basically what it means is we now have jump key pressed which will register for one frame and we have a second variable that is basically doing the same thing except it lasts for three whole frames instead of just one um, and we can change that number to be you know we can have it last for 10 frames if we want to or you know 30 frames 30 which would be a lot but um we can actually just test this out right now so before we add any more code Code. let's do this really quick let's go back to our player in our create event we now need to add our control setup so controls setup so now we have those variables that we need and we're getting our controls now so just to prove this instead of checking for our jump key press what we can basically do is look for our jump key buffered input so if our jump key buffered is equal to true and we're touching the ground then that means we will jump and i'm just going to set this to a pretty high number so 30 frames is half a second so that's a very very long time as far as a game input is concerned but it'll mean that we can test this and it will be very very easily testable so uh, i'm also going to set the jumping speed to be a kind of high number again so six test it real quick so jumping still works normally so what should happen is i should be able to press the jump button before the player even lands and the jumps should still register so let me see if you can i'm just gonna hold this up so maybe you can hear it yeah do you hear that yeah, so I pressed way before the, you know, I actually hit the ground. Um, and obviously you wouldn't want it to have such a huge discrepancy like that, like such a huge window, because that, that feels very strange. But the idea is basically if the player is running around and jumping 
they're trying to get frame perfect jumps for some reason or whatever um if you want to just make it a little bit easier on the player then you can give them like i said like maybe three maybe five frames of a little grace period where that will actually work out for them so it doesn't become frame perfect at that point it you know becomes like maybe a, a like a 15th of a second instead of a 60th of a second where you can input that it's just a feel thing because otherwise it feels like if you're just that one frame off and you're literally within a 60th of a second but you're not checking for that buffer it can kind of feel like maybe the game ate your input where it it actually didn't but as far as your feeble human perception goes uh you have no idea that that's the case so yeah one more thing that i want to show is a little quirk about it let's say I, i'm gonna set this to 300 frames which is a very long time um and watch what happens if i jump so, and i'm just gonna press it once one time look at that my player is still jumping until yep until that 300 frames have passed because what's happening is we're setting our jump key buffered to be true for 300 entire frames so depending on how the movement in your game works and stuff like that uh you probably don't want this behavior again you know we're gonna set this pretty low we'll probably set it to three or five or something like that so if i set it to three that's probably never gonna happen that like double jumping or whatever but you never know how complex your code is gonna get or how weird you want to get with your collisions or whatever how specific your player's movement is going to be and things like slopes and moving platforms and all that stuff you really don't know what's necessarily going to be happening frame to frame especially if the player has a really low jump speed so my point is kind of no matter what this is just to give the player a bigger window to do that input but you only want it to register that one input because the player only pressed the button one time that's that's all they want to do so a really simple way to kind of remedy that is basically if you've successfully jumped here you can do this you can just say jump key buffered equals false and jump key buffer timer equals zero. You can reset the buffer because there we go. You can reset the buffer because we now know that we've successfully jumped. So we don't need this to be buffered anymore. The one input that the player inputted that they wanted to has done what they wanted it to do in this case. So now we can go back. Uh, I can set this back to 300 hit play. And if I do a jump, player only jumps once. However, if you listen to me double tap really fast because we have that 300 frames again, watch. See, it still has that big buffer for us, but we only jumped twice because we only input the button twice. So good game feel thing. Uh, however, 300 frames of input buffer uh, is not a really good game feel, if you ask me. Unless, of course, you have some special, you know, your game is... You know, never listen to me when I say something's a bad idea. Sometimes it's a good idea. But for the most part, you probably don't want that. If you add some kind of visual feel... You know what? Never mind. I'm not going to do this, this whole thing. All right? Make your own game. God. No, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I just get carried away when I start talking about that stuff. The point is, we are fine now. So that is kind of an improvement on our controls and showing you how basic button uh, buffering can work. Lately, I've been kind of partial to doing it this way with these functions that you set in the step and create event. And for uh, certain things and for each individual kind of action I would want to have a buffer for, I do it for that separately. Um, and if you did have a bunch of different buffer things, you know, three frames doesn't have to be the input buffer for every single button that you want to do. You could specifically make this like jump buffer time, right? And then uh, change this down here to that. So if, for example, you eventually added melee attack and you wanted there to be a little bit of a buffer there. Maybe you wanted it to be longer or shorter, um, then you, you know, you could do that. So, so you know what? I might as well just keep that as its own thing. So jump buffer time, jump buffer time, doesn't really matter. Okay, so we've cleaned that up a little bit and now we have the ability to hold our jump button, right? So I say that's what we're gonna focus on first is controlling a jump height. As far as most platformers are concerned, that is a little bit more important than something like coyote time, but we'll get to that right after this. So once again, check and make sure all this is the same, especially this part, make sure these three are all called jump key and make sure these are not looking for the pressed versions but it's just keyboard check gamepad check if you're using a gamepad and you're clamping it zero to one all that stuff now let's get to our player because even though we added this stuff right here we're about to change some things so let me try and make some room here oh yeah here we go oh i'm also realizing right now that uh i totally forgot to add in that terminal velocity code which is very simple even though i told you to make a thing for it i'm also going to change this back to negative 3.15 so yeah i mean this is this is a very simple stuff so before we do our y collision we'll call this y collision and movement and this is the collision right here and this will be cap our falling speed you can say if our y speed is greater than our terminal velocity so we're falling too fast then we can just set our y speed to be our terminal velocity and that'll just make sure we can't fall too fast 
It was an easy thing to overlook because we have such a small little playroom and there wasn't any really high ledge to jump off of. So we never really built up that much speed in the first place. But anyways, that's how you add the terminal velocity right there. And I'm gonna say all this goes under the Y collision and movement. So anyways, now let's get on to improving our jump by being able to control it and add the opportunity for things like double jumps. So before we mess with anything over here, let's go back to our create event and add a couple new variables. So we can add a jump maximum. So this is the maximum numbers of jumps that we can perform. Mm, at default, I'm just gonna set it to one and then we'll test higher numbers once we finish programming everything. Doesn't really matter what you set it to, just as long as it's above zero. Uh, we need a variable called jump count. And this is how many jumps we've actually performed, right? So keeping track, if we've already jumped once, then we shouldn't be able to jump again. And then this is where controlling our jump speed and being able to like let go of the button and jump, have a shorter jump or whatever works. So we're gonna have a timer called jump hold timer. We're gonna set that equal to zero. And then we need a specific amount of frames that we are allowed to hold our jump. So I'm gonna say jump hold frames. And I set that equal to 18. Uh, again, th these really specific looking numbers, they could be anything. These are just the numbers that I kind of ultimately landed on and thought felt pretty good. But this could be any number of frames you want the player to be able to hold the jump. Because what we're gonna be doing is we want to say for 18 frames, we want to be able to sustain our jumping speed. And then after that, our gravity is gonna kick in and start adding to it. And lastly, we already know that it's very important for our jumping to make sure that we're already on the ground. So we're touching a wall and we're actually basically gonna store this piece of information in a variable that we can set. So we're gonna add one more variable and we're gonna call this on ground. And we'll start off by setting that equal to true. And this is just gonna tell us if we're on the ground or not. The main benefit of storing this in a variable is that we're not gonna have to do a ton of extra collision checks to see if we're on the ground or in the air. And yeah, so let's get going. So definitely pay attention during this part. We're gonna be doing a little bit of uh, upheavals and a little bit of changes in this Y movement category. So first, let's, let's just see how we wanna get this on ground variable, okay? Now we're already checking here, but uh, if in you ask me, kind of the most logical place to get the on ground variable check. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this really quick. To find that on ground variable, a good place to do it is after our precise collision with the ground. And I'm gonna do that right here. So set if I'm on the ground. And the way we're gonna do that right now is I'm just gonna say if our Y speed is greater than or equal to zero. So basically just as long as we're not moving upwards and there is a place meeting directly below us. So X in our Y position plus one with uh, an object wall, just like we checked last time, we're gonna say on ground equals true. And for now we can say, you know, otherwise we'll set our on ground to be false. It's basically the same thing, except we're just setting it in a variable and we're setting it after this precise collision. So that way we make sure that, you know, if we did hit a ground while going downwards, like while falling down because of gravity, we can just check the one pixel below. We don't have to check for our whole Y speed or anything like that. We don't have to compensate for anything weird like that. We can just check directly below us. So if we go up here, if we get the jump key buffered and we are on the ground, then this code should function exactly the same as it did before. And we can test that really quick if we want to. So yeah, it does. And I can just walk off a ledge and I'll start falling down, great. Exactly the same. May seem like we didn't accomplish much, but it will be important, especially as we move forward. So as long as you got that working, then we're good. Now, that was just a test and make sure that our on ground is working fine. We don't actually only want to be able to jump when we're on the ground because double jumping exists, right? We're, we're trying to do this in a way where we can jump as many times as we want to let the player be able to. So being on the ground is not a prerequisite for being able to jump. It's just as long as we haven't jumped above our maximum allowance. So we wanna say if our jump key has been buffered and our jump count is less than our jump maximum, right? Like that's when we want to jump. We're going to reset the buffer. We're going to increase the number of performed jumps. So we'll say our jump count plus plus, right? And then we set our Y speed. So if I go back to the create event and I say our maximum jumps are, let's say two, then as long as I haven't jumped twice, I should be able to jump no matter if I'm in the air or on the ground. So if I were to run the game and test that, jump, jump. Yep, double jump. However, now I can't jump anymore. And once again, I'm gonna change my jumping speed to a higher number just to show that off again. So jump, jump, double jump works fine, but now I can't jump anymore. And that's because every time we jump, we're adding to our jump count. So we don't go above our maximum allotted number of jumps. However, our jump count is never reset. And that's where the ground comes into play. When we're on the ground, that's when we wanna reset our jump numbers. So I'm gonna add something up here and say reset slash 
prepare jumping variables. So I'm gonna say if on ground, then we'll reset our jump count. So then it becomes zero. So now if I run the game, double jump and double jump, nice. And I can't jump more than twice, but once I hit the ground, it all resets and we're all good. Excellent. But now we've got one more issue, watch this. So if I get up on here, let's watch. One, two. Oh, let's see. I still got two jumps in the air, even though I was already falling. See, that's so technically that's almost like a trip two extra jumps, right? Normally in like a Mario game, if you run off a ledge and you are only allowed to jump once, you can't jump again. If I go to the create event and change my maximum number of jumps to just one, then I'll still be able to jump once in the air. So a very easy, easy fix for that is this. If we're on the ground, we want to reset our jump count. However, if we're not on the ground, so if we're in the air, we can say if the player is in the air, make sure they can't do an extra jump. And that's a really easy thing to do. We can just say if our jump count is equal to zero, which means we haven't initiated a jump yet, then we can just set our jump count to be one, right? Treat walking or falling off a ledge the same as if the player input a jump, right? Because that would be the point in which you lost one. So now that I have a jump maximum of one, no double jumping. And if I walk off this ledge, I can't save myself with an extra air jump. Say if I change that back to two, double jump, double jump working good, and I only get one extra jump in the air. Great. So that's pretty cool. And now that we understand the logic of how jumping works and the conditions in which we can jump and all that stuff, now we can work on controlling the height of each of those jumps by holding the button. And like I said, that's gonna be mostly involving this jump hold timer thing. So finally, I'm gonna switch my jumping speed back to what I had it originally, 3.15, negative 3.15, and here we go. So back to our little bit of jumping code here. I'm going to change this code to say, initiate the jump. And what we're actually gonna do is, like I said, we're gonna be setting this based on our timer. So we want to set our timer and we actually don't need to have this code right here. So we can get rid of this. We're going to say set the jump hold timer. So I'm going to say the jump hold timer is going to equal our jump hold frames. And so below this chunk of code, we can say jump based on the timer slash holding the button. And so if our jump hold timer is greater than zero, which it is once we've initiated our jump, it's at the moment, it's 18 frames. If it's over, we can constantly set the Y speed to be the jumping speed. So Y speed equals our J speed. And we can say count down the timer, say jump hold timer minus minus. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna scrunch this stuff up a little bit up here and do that. So this will actually look very, very, very similar to what we had. Again, uh, I've set my J speed back to negative 3.15. We're not canceling this timer at all, so it'll just play out the same way as it did before. So if I jump once, you'll see we do like a single jump, but you'll kind of see the way it works too. It's got this linear constant movement up until the gravity kicks back in. Um, and I say that gravity's kicking in the whole time. It's just the fact that we're no longer constantly setting our Y speed. So you'll probably notice that a lot of games look more like this, not when you tap a button, but when you hold it. And so basically in order to cut off the jump, we can do it by releasing the jump button. So we can say, if not jump key, which means jump key is, you know, the input that we're getting for holding the jump button. So if we're not holding the jump button anymore, we can just set our jump hold timer to zero, which will effectively cut this code off, right? It'll no longer be greater than zero. So we won't be setting the speed constantly. And if we look at what that looks like in game, it looks like this tapping the jump button goes, just tiny little hop and then you can hold it for a big, big jump, right? This is how most games function more or less. And I think, yep, I still have my double jump in there. And so each double jump gets its own. You can do a short hop and then a long hop, long hop, long hop. And so yeah, pretty cool. That's a, uh, that's how it works. And if you want the height and the speed or whatever, uh, the frame duration of each jump to be different, uh, you could turn these variables into an array very easily and just pass in the jump count, right? So so I, I'm just gonna move this down here. You don't have to do this, but for example, we could turn the amount of frames that we wanna be able to jump, hold the jump button and the speed into an array and we could pass in the jump count variable, right? So just a quick little interjection since I hadn't talked about them in this series yet. There's a good chance you know what they are, but if not, an array 
essentially looks a lot like a variable, but uh, it can hold a bunch of different values instead of just one, which is why an array looks like this. It starts at zero and just increments in positive one, so uh, an array is like a list of information, and so this makes it really, really easy to do something like pass in a variable here to get different values based on the same variable name. Uh, and it's also extremely, extremely useful for things like doing loops, which we will eventually get into in this series. So yep, just a quick little explanation of what those are. So I would say definitely follow along with what I'm about to do in the video, but also this is a good example of something. I added this on the fly without it being in my demo project. So uh, this specific code, I didn't end up testing nearly as thoroughly as I tested a bunch of other stuff and I was just a assuming that it would be kind of fine. It mostly was, but there's a couple bugs with it. One we'll deal with in a future video, in the Coyote Time video, because the bug kind of interacts with that system. But there is one that's actually a crash and an error, and uh, I fixed that later in the video. So don't worry about it. I'll mention both of the issues again. Like I said, we'll actually fix the one that causes the crash, but just keep following along with me. And if you're following along and at some point you find a crash, that's probably the same one. So I'll get to it, I promise. All right, let's get back to it. But for example, we could turn the amount of frames that we want to be able to jump, hold the jump button and the speed into an array, and we could pass in the jump count variable, right? So um, again, this is just an example. You don't have to do what I'm doing, but so maybe the first First jump, you can hold the button for 18 frames and it goes this fast. But maybe for the second jump, you only want to be able to hold it for 10 frames and it doesn't go as fast. So it goes like this much or something. You could then just change this to the proper jump number, which we would actually have to pass in jump count minus one because we add the jump count here the moment we jump, right? So for our very first jump, we want to access jump hold frames zero and J speed zero. So that would be jump count minus one. So we could add that there to that and we could set the J speed here to jump count minus one. And you'll see if I do a double jump um, and I hold both for as long as I can. See, the second one was a lot wimpier. So yeah, you could do something like that. Um, a game I can immediately think of is uh, Momodora Reverie Under the Moonlight, where the second jump is a lot more pathetic than the first one. And it's supposed to be based on how well you can time it. Do you actually get the benefits of, uh, of that jump? So yeah, uh, if you want to make your code a little bit more complex, you can do that. And you can just, you know, turn this information into arrays. And remember, you need to have an entry for each number of jumps that the player should be able to do. Hopefully that makes sense. And you know what? I might as well just leave it. Okay, as promised, I'm back to talk about those issues that I mentioned earlier. So, like I said, there's a specific Coyote Time uh, issue that's going to show up, but we haven't done Coyote Time yet, so that's cool. We're going to cover it there. However, there's another actual little bug with this that I'm going to show you right now. I'm just going to run my game. I'm going to walk my player under a little wall. My project's going to look a little bit different than yours right now. And when right under this super tight wall, I'm going to try and jump, and I'm going to get an error. And it says that basically we are trying to, we are looking at our J-Speed array, and it's going out of range, which either means that this number that we're trying to pass through the array is too high, so it's larger than the array, or it's below zero. So in this case, negative one. And that's actually what's happening here. So I'm gonna explain that really quick and show you how we can fix it. It was just a, a very simple oversight to make whenever adding this new code, because obviously this error is based on an array, which I didn't have in my original project. So it's actually pretty simple. Uh, the organization might look a little bit different, but this is the same exact code that you had. So basically what's happening here, let's say we initiate our jump. So we jump, our jump count goes up, which is great. And so we're getting the jump hold frames of our jump count minus one. I already explained why we do that and that's still fine and then because we set our jump hold timer to be above zero right here then we're going to constantly be setting our y speed to this certain j speed which if we saw on the error this is the line that was giving us the problem which i have a lot more code in here right now so the line number is going to be different for you but it's when we're holding down the button to keep jumping basically what's happening is we're jumping, we're adding to the jump count. Jump hold timer is greater than zero, so we start jumping. That's great. Then we do our Y collision here. And because we were in that really, really tight little space, we immediately get a collision the same frame that we pressed the jump button because our jump speed was negative 3.15. So within that space directly above us, there was already a wall. So we're getting this Y collision here, you know, our Y speed is getting set to zero. And then we're doing this code. We're getting the on ground variables. And so even though we just tried to jump, we know for a fact that we're still on the ground because in that 
instance where our player was wedged between these two like this, there's nowhere up for the player to go. So the player tries to jump, nothing happens. And so the player still thinks that they are on the ground, which they are. And so what happens is the next frame of the game, so we finish our step event and we start running through the step event again to do our Y mo movement. And basically what's happened here is our jump hold timer is still greater than zero. Because remember, it's only been a single frame. Our jump hold timer has not had time to reset to zero by just either counting itself down naturally or by the player releasing the button because it's literally been one frame, right? So what's happening is we're getting back down to this code and it's still trying to run. But up here, since we're still on the ground, our jump count has been reset to zero. So, so really what happens is we come around, we're on ground, our jump count gets set to zero. And then we get down to this piece of code. Our jump count is now zero, but our jump hold timer is still above zero. So now we're getting zero minus one equals negative one. This wouldn't be a big deal if I wasn't using the arrays, but since I added them, it is a big deal because we're checking within the confines of this array. So that's totally fine. Just a very simple thing that we can do is we can say if we're on the ground, so up here where we uh, pr prepare, oh boy, pretty sure I, okay. Um, so w as long as we're on the ground up here, we can also say our jump hold timer needs to be equal to zero. So yeah, because if we're on the ground, then that means we're not jumping basically. Uh, and and that's that'll fix our problem. So if I run the game and get under here and I jump, see, <laughs> I'm, I'm moving in the sub pixels right now. So you can see a little bit of hopping, but yeah, um, that's basically what's happening here. And again, just to reiterate, the reason that that crashed in the first place is essentially because our code thought that we were still jumping whenever we were actually on the ground. Because when this timer is above zero, our code thinks we're jumping, so we're looking to set a J speed. But since we were already on the ground, our jump count minus one was going out of range. So again, if we're on the ground, we set our jump hold timer to zero because we're not jumping anymore. Great. And another reason that I didn't notice this necessarily is because there is another piece of code that occasionally I will put in this that I want to show you right now. I'm going to call this the, the head bonking code. So this is a bug fix, but now I'm moving into one thing that I just kind of forgot to put in part two because it's a very, very simple line of code. And uh, this is basically, you know, currently the way our stuff works is I'm going to set it up here. So set it up here and hit play. If I were to hold the button, See, the player gets stuck there for a second while I'm holding it because if I show you like this, oh yeah, see, if I'm holding the button, um, my player is not bonking on the ceiling, my player is just jumping and having their Y speed stop while running into a wall, but the jump hold timer is not done yet, you know? Jump hold timer is still counting, so my player is still trying to move up for those uh, 18 or so frames. Forget any of this extra stuff you're seeing, all right? It's not it's not relevant to you. So we can go in here, we can go into our Y collision, and we can go after our precise movement, and before we set our Y speed to zero, this is important because we're gonna be checking our Y speed, we can say this should be bonk code. And we can say if our Y speed is less than zero, which means if we were traveling upwards, then we can set our jump hold timer to be zero, which just basically acts like releasing the jump button, which means it stops our jump. So if I were to run the game now and jump into these, yeah, look at that. So I can't do what I was doing before. My player bonks and starts going back down. So that's obviously just a creative choice, whichever one you want to have in your game. Uh, if you don't want to have the bonk code, you can just comment all of this out like this. And you can write here, you can even write optional. So you can, uh, oopsie. So you can enable or disable that if you want to, but you can keep it there just so you have the option. But yeah, so I mentioned the bonk code later in the series. I end up adding it later, but uh, it just makes more sense to add it here. So anyways, that's that. And I'm gonna clean up, I'm gonna organize this a little bit better. I'm gonna put the on-ground variable. I'm gonna put that with the gravity and the terminal velocity. And then I'm gonna label this as jump values for each suck excessive jump that looks weird hope i spelled that right maybe even just do it out. i like to tab things out a lot i don't know if that's like disgusting looking for programmers i'm not a real programmer i'm a game developer i'm a i'm a solo indie game developer i'm not a real anything and i'm a youtuber on top of that apparently so i don't know i'm sorry if this doesn't work for you but something about it looks nice to me in fact i might even clean yeah i'm not gonna clean this up right now but anyways you get the point hopefully you understand how that all makes sense and hopefully just for the sake of me not going too far into that i uh put a little explanation of what an array is you probably know but if you don't I'll just explain it 
But anyways, I'm just going to keep it there. However, I personally am going to change jump max to one. Because if you want just a little opinion piece here, I'm not super big on double jumps in general. I'm not a, as I grow old and gray, I, uh, I'm much more partial to other more interesting movement types in platformer games. So yeah, I'm not huge on, huge on double jumps. But hey, if you want to double jump in your game, here's how you put it in. And you freaking put your double jump in your game, man. Don't listen to me. But anyways, it's functioning. I'm going to keep mine at one right now. And we control the jump height of our jump in all the successive jumps. It's all sounding great to me. All right, nice work. The next video is actually going to be like an optional video on making a simple little camera system for us to have here. It's pretty unrelated to actual platforming and it doesn't interact with any of our other systems. So if you don't need it, if you have a camera that you think is good, then don't worry about it. But uh, I think it's a pretty good little camera, actually. It turned out it turned out pretty nice. But so watch the next one if you want to. Other than that, the next video, mechanically speaking, is going to be covering Coyote Time. You probably know what that is if you're interested in game development. But if not, do not skip that video. You're going to learn a lot. Coyote Time is one of the most fundamental things to modern platformer games and game feel. It's really interesting. It's really cool. And like I and honestly, I consider it to be pretty essential. So yeah, that's it. So yeah, again, housekeeping. Please wishlist my game, StarCross Arcade Special on Steam. And you can play the free demo of Rose of StarCross if you want to. If StarCross Arcade is out, then you should just buy it. Be a, be a pal. And otherwise, if you want videos early, or if you want the project file for this platformer series, like the, the full finished project file, if you need it to compare to, or whatever you want to do with it, that's up on my Patreon. And not only that, but you can get your name shouted out in the credits if you are as cool as Nixionic, Null, Joseph Sandlin, Midnight, AOGO, Christian Donovan, Jazzy, DT, Richard DeLuca, Arya Sparks, Maya, Robel, Crazy Poo Chucker, Harrison, Joshua, Takuni, Ruben Lievo, Moody, Mikel Alexander, David Rivas, NerdBoutique.com, Carlos Acosta, John Brown, Pixel, Frog Salt, Joshua Hurry, Marco Romo, Howie, Sam Live, Andreas Premel, Bill Lotti, AOAO, Amar Ali, Nick Lee, Matthew Carr, C, Mancat, Patrick, Yaskarit Brar, I'm gonna stand by that one, Dean Blackborough, Micah Smith, Matt Lumens, Jonah Newman, and Finn Leavell. You guys are the absolute best. Super appreciate it, and I love you. Uh, and I love you too. If you're just someone who's watching the video, you don't have to be a Patreon member, you don't have to be a subscriber. You just have to be a cool person. And if you're a cool person, then I probably love you. So anyways, that's it. See you in the next one. Have a good day.